things like uh, CSR, things like uh, CNVMs, management of diabetic macular edema, RVO, epithelial membrane. These are some macular disorders which uh, all of us encounter in our practice. And uh, the purpose of this uh, IC was to uh, uh, discuss the importance of these and have a algorithm kind of thing how everyone how we approach these disorders and uh, we are joined by you know uh, very prominent speakers dr raju dr ritesh dr mallika and dr nindra who will carry us through this uh, journey and uh, the first talk will be on central series retinopathy and dr raju is here he will elucidate uh, the recent uh, understanding of CSR that it's a primarily a choroidal disease also it is known as CSR retinopathy but it's C CSCR and how should we practically approach these patients you know primary patients recurrent CSR bullous CSR and I think uh, Raju will take us through this uh, journey thanks uh, Raju uh, very good afternoon thank you very much sir for giving me this opportunity uh, in your IC so, uh, CSR is considered as the fourth most common non-surgical retinopathy associated with fluid leakage. And it was first recognized way back in 1866, and it was termed as central recurrent retinitis. However, it was uh, Gas who explained the pathogenesis and explained the clinical features and named it as central serious chorioretinopathy. So let me start off with some spotters. Is this CSR? This is spotter number two. Is this a CSR? Now, by history, how can we get some clues? So we all know that CSR is seen in middle-aged males. It's painless uh, onset of uh, diminution of vision. They may complain of micropsia, and they may have positive scotoma. So you should also ask a history of whether intake of any steroid medicines is there. But if you casually ask them, do you use any steroid medicines, they'll tell no. So we need to ask pointed questions. Are they taking any skin ointments? Are they using any inhalers or any other preparations? Then the patient may tell that I'm using some ointment for a skin allergy or so. Also assess the patient's personality. Does he have any Cushingoid features? And rule out pregnancy in a female patient. So a good history taking is important because we can identify the risk factors that are there for this patient. And a drug history, even oral contraceptive pills can cause, various drugs used for cancer can cause uh, CSR. And commonly used or uh, drugs like sildenafil can also cause CSR. So a good history taking is important. Now, coming back to this spotter, is this a CSR? Well, when we did an indirect ophthalmoscopy, this patient actually had a retinal detachment. You can see the, the attached and the detached retina here. And this actually turned out to be a retinal detachment, a regmatogenous retinal detachment with an inferior break. So if you don't do a good examination, you'll miss out on findings. So look for corrugated appearance it could be a shallow retinal detachment. So it's very important that we do a good indirect ophthalmoscopy before ordering an OCT. So because differentiating a CSR from RD, RD is important because if you miss an RD, we are doing a harm to the patient. So one should not make a diagnosis of CSR without being sure of the extent. Although it is important to rule out RD, we should not be under the impression that the CSR does not extend to the periphery because rarely you have what is called as an atypical CSR, wherein it can extend to the periphery with multifocal detachments. This is a patient who presented with a diminution of vision since 25 days. He was treated as an exudative RD with steroids and he, because he had a peripheral detachment. And when we did the FFA, we could see multiple pigment epithelial detachments. And this patient actually was a patient of a multifocal CSR. And all we had to do was to stop the steroids and this patient did well. Coming to this spotter number two. Now, whenever you see a patient whom you suspect as a CSR, make sure you have a look at the disc. This actually is a patient with optic disc, uh, pit retinopathy, and 
always make sure to have a careful examination of the optic disc whenever you suspect a CSR. Now, this is another patient who came with a sudden decrease in vision and was suspected to have a CSR. So what would be your next investigation? Would you do a OCT, would you do a FFA, or would you do both of them? Then commonly we would go ahead and do a OCT. What would you explain to this patient? Would you do observation or would you go ahead and do FFA in this patient? Well, OCT was not the next investi investigation to do in this patient. The most important investigation was to do a good slit lamp examination because a patient had retroenteral cells in this patient. So the next investigation, logical investigation was FFA and B scan. And this patient turned out to be a case of posterior scleritis. And T sign was there on B scan. So this patient required a steroid. So this is not a CSR, this is a posterior scleritis. This is another patient who was suspected as CSR and sent to me. And when we did the FFA, the patient had a idiopathic CNVM. So these are the various differential diagnoses that one will face when you are seeing a patient of suspected CSR. This is another patient which can mimic a CSR, it's a PCV. So the typical uh, FFA, we all have learned that ink blot appearance and the smokestack appearance on FFA. And chronic CSR, you will see these tracks. Autofluorosis is one more important tool that can help us to uh, visualize the CSR and the various uh, damage to the RP that it has caused. However, OCT continues to be the most important tool in managing these patients as we can see the reduction in height and also reduction in the area of the CSR on on face images. With the enhanced depth OCT, we'll be able to make out the increased choroidal thickness in these patients. Because right now, the CSR pathology is considered as a choroidal hyperpermeability, and the choroidal pathology is the reason for the fluid in the retina. The, even the uh, recent classifications, this is the recent classification by the international group, lays a bay, lot of emphasis on the OCT here. You have classified the CSR into simple, complex, and atypical. And they are again further subdivided into primary, recurrent, and resolved. And if the SRF is persisting for more than six months, they is called as persistent. And all, both simple and complex, with, can have with or without outer retinal atrophy. So this is the latest classification for CSR. So they are also classified and given the major criteria and minor criteria, and this lays emphasis on the OCT part. Coming to the treatment, so whenever you see a patient of acute CSR, the most commonly what we do is the conservative management and look whether the patient is highly symptomatic or is a recurrent episode or it's a bilateral disease activity. So if it is highly, highly symptomatic, recurrent, then one may consider a uh, treatment, active treatment, that is a laser. So most important before you consider this treatment is to eliminate the risk factors, reduction of emotional stress, treating uh, the anxiety and other things. Because most of our patients would resolve spontaneously. If at all we want to treat, we have to go ahead and treat with a focal laser, with a green laser for uh, extra foveal leak. However, if it is subfoveal, we may have to consider a high density uh, subthreshold micropulse laser in these patients. This is a patient who was treated uh, for the focal leak. You can see the reduction in the SRF. Usually by around one to one and a half months, you can see the re resolution happening. As far as the medical treatment is concerned, the two drugs that are commonly used are the spironolactone and epipyrone. However, they have very modest uh, efficacy as far as improving the BCV is concerned. And in this uh, second uh, study which was done, wherein it was studied in chronic CSR patient, it was not found superior to placebo. However, whenever you are using these drugs, you should, especially epipyrone, you should look out for hyperkalemia. So get a serum electrolytes tested in these patients. However, my experience has been good. This is a patient who came with a CSR which had a thick exudative uh, fluid in the subretinal space. And this is after treatment with epilinron at around uh, two months time or three months time. 
This another patient, same with an exudative uh, CSCR with treated with epineuron. So even in chronic CSCR, it has been reported that these patients do well, but however, some patients may not respond. As far as antioxidants is concerned, again, they do not show any benefit with respect to visual acuity. However, they significantly reduce the subretinal flu high fluid height. So there's a decreased chance of fluorescein leakage and additional treatments uh, required were less at the end of three months. As far as NSAID is concerned, there's very minimal role for use of napafenag or any other anti, uh, non steroid anti-inflammatory agents. Let us come to some unusual situations in CSCR. One is in pregnancy. This is usually seen uh, in the third trimester and usually resolves spontaneously after delivery. And most commonly you see exudative type of CSCR in pregnancy. Other condition is a sleep apnea syndrome that one may have to consider in these patients. And it is said that uh, it can be seen in about two thirds of the patients of CSR patients. The next uh, entity is called as something that is very unusual. You heard it right. This is familial CSR, familial CSR. So this, I had a patient in 2011 who presented with a counting finger vision. And this was his presentation when he came to me with a bilateral executive detachment. When we look back to his FFA in 2008, he had uh, features that were suggestive of a CSCR. How, what we had to do was, he was put on steroids by somebody else. We had to just stop the steroids and after that he improved. But one interesting development that happened was the patient's sister came for a routine checkup. She had a six by six vision. She had some pigmentary changes. For that, she was referred to me and we did the OCT we could see shallow fluid and the FFA revealed small PEDs. So when I went back and searched the literature, actually there is a condition called as familial serous retinopathy that has been described way back in 1996. So very rarely one may have to consider this uh, differential diagnosis. To conclude, CSR is a commonly encountered disease in day-to-day -day practice, understanding the etiologies, differential diagnosis and various presentations will help us in managing these patients better. Thank you very much. And nice presentation. Any questions from the audience? So uh, first thing for the benefit of the audience, uh, how long will you uh, wait for uh, any kind of uh, invasive laser or anything uh, how long will you like to wait before going in for any kind of treatment? So, so I, as I said before, uh, in my patient, I usually wait for three months. So for three months, I just communicate to the patient that uh, to reduce their stress and look for other risk factors that they have and try to address those stress. And at the end of three months, if they still have the fluid, I monitor them on monthly basis on a OCT. And uh, if they still have fluid, then I would consider any other treatment in these patients. So uh, one thing uh, you can define CSR as an acute CSR and you can define CSR as a chronic, chronic CSR. CSR. And the treatment of acute CSR is just observation and chronic CSR you have to go for a multiple modalities of treatment what Dr. Raju has mentioned. Uh, you have a question yeah. then. Uh, uh, good afternoon everyone. Do you have any experience with uh, melatonin in CSR? Sorry? Do you have any experience uh, with melatonin yeah, in it's CSCR? Been rep reported, but personally, I have not had an experience. It's been reported yeah. with uh, skin usage for the skin treatment, right? But sometimes they may have a combination of treatments. That's the other thing that we have to look at. So I uh, usually ask the patient to get the drugs and the ointments to me next time when they come, so that we look at what are the contents of the drugs. Raju, when do you any epilon? When you mentioned that many patients, I have a good experience with aplinol. So, uh, which patients uh, you take up for this drug? For? Aplinol. Aplinol. So, those patients at the end of three months or if they're presenting to me with a two months or a three month history, wherein they already have waited for two months or three months with another doctor, at that time and if I see the fluid is, uh, as I showed you in my presentation, the uh, patients with thick uh, exudates, 
uh, in those patient i directly try to consider epinephrine hello everyone sir is there any role of seracio peptidase in csr role of seracio peptidase no ma'am not that i am aware of okay. sir any correlation between hair dye and development of csr no patient using hair dye and after he develops csr no no, no not that type of uh, i have seen thing... few patients which used hair dye and after 10 to uh, uh, one week or 10 days they complain of diminution of vision and we diagnose this csr that's why uh, one thing you should always ask whether they are using any skin creams which contain steroids or not if there is any history then you should ask these patient to stop skin creams with steroid because that is known to cause csr a worsen csr but uh, as per literature uh, we don't have any correlation between hair dye and central serous retinopathy okay thank you uh, uh, nice talk doctor yeah sorry so is there any role of carbonic anhydrase inhibitors oral or topical uh, in the treatment of csr no no ma'am uh, doctor aj nice talk i had uh, two questions to ask one how is your approach different when you are dealing with very fibrin kind of a csr number 2 uh, do you consider using maybe a strong anti vegf when you are typically dealing with a pachycoroid kind of a, how do you take that as a treatment option no I, uh, as far as exudative is concerned as i mentioned before if it is very thick exudate i consider epineuron right from the beginning in those patients and in the pachycoroid unless there is a cnv i would not consider an anti vegf in these patients so what's your uh, take uh, what what do you sir uh, you, you Shall I? Yeah, yeah. I, I have I have a question. So uh, a patient came to me, an acute CSR, and uh, the leak is extramacular, simple CSR, and we just wait, try to figure out the uh, if he has stress or anything, steroids, and we wait normally, and in a month or two months it goes away, fine, it resolves. But we find that uh, the, although the CSR is gone, but there are some fine hard exudates in the macular region. because we waited about 2 months for the fluid to go away and now the patient's vision is 6 by 6 but little less and the contrast sensitivity has gone down a little bit now i wonder that what would have have happened if i had treated because it's an extramacular leak away if i had put in a few spots of laser uh, like 4 weeks after and uh, prevented that hard exudate forming and the contrast sensitivity going down because for life his contrast sensitivity is gone what's your comment uh, as far as i am concerned i usually treat it at 3 months but having said that whenever the resolution of the fluid is very fast then also the hard exudates can still form what you are telling so at the end what are the previous uh, experience is that whether you do early laser or late laser the final visual outcome turns out to be the same that's what uh, is what we have learned from experience in literature uh, thank you w- one thing about the exudates the exudates what you are calling are subretinal precipitates yes, that yellow yellow things what you see these are subretinal precipitates and they go with time you don't need to treat that second thing about contrast sensitivity once the fluid disappears the contrast sensitivity comes only by 3 months patient complains ki there is a decrease in vision but the contrast sensitivity comes by 3 months with this uh, i uh, requ- one thing sir uh, i'll uh, ask dr ritesh narula to put his talk on the dais and uh, he is a consultant at uh, lb prashad eye center and he'll be talking about other most or must know macular disease that is diabetic macular edema by the time somebody yeah, was asking uh, yeah, any yeah. here sir uh, if we find hard exudate in csr probably we are dealing with some other pathology there are some other pathology going on generally hard exudate doesn't seen in csr cases maybe something else we are dealing with yeah uh, raju will you like to answer look uh, th- if you have an hard exudates uh, then with uh, a serious kind of a detachment my most likely diagnosis will be pcv very good afternoon to all of you uh, thank you dr lalit verma for inviting me to be a part of this instruction course and the topic that he has given to me is something that we are dealing day in and day out i have to talk on management of dme 
I'll look at it from, talk about it from my perspective, how things have changed for me over a period of time. I also talk to talk this, talk about this topic as DME and anti-VEGF. Has anything changed? We have almost have a decade of experience working with anti-VEGF, more than a decade on DME and what has changed over a period of time. So two parts my presentation is going to divide into. One is what the anti-VEGF trials have taught us and how do I best use in my clinical practice. There has been a great change over the management of DME over a period of time and there is plethora of evidence from multiple randomized trials uh, talking about the use of anti-VEGFs and how to use them and showing great results. Uh, multiple regimes have been worked on. Uh, there are fixed regimes, PRN, treat and extend. We have all worked on that. Large RCT like DRCR group, what it came up with and shows showed the benefit of using anti-VEGF and a long-term benefit over a period of two years. A slight superiority of uh, aflibercept and ranibizumab over bevacizumab in terms of reducing the macular thickness and in terms of uh, a near about similar response and visual acuity over a period of two years. These studies also showed the importance of the initial phase of treatment wherein you need to be more aggressive with DME management. Patients do require a lot more injections early in their treatment. Uh, and as the years progress, the number of injections keep going down. And so much so that by about 25% uh, patient after a certain period of time don't even require any more injections. So unlike AMD, which is a very uh, infinite disease, DME tends to have a more finite kind of a treatment. Also, TNE, PRN, loading dose all have shown good results with TNE and PRN uh, working almost hand in hand. In Indian scenario, uh, what we have seen and interpreted from trials wherein the cost of traveling is a lot more than, uh, I mean, the cost of injection is a lot more than the cost of traveling. PRN works pretty well for us in Indian scenario. So these are what we have been gathering from the trials which have happened on DME. So this is what we have learned that anti-VEGF are the gold standards for managing DME and amongst anti-VEGF, ranibizumab, aflibercept working slightly better than vivazizumab. Initial aggressive therapy, I said, is good for good visual gains. And what you gain initially, then you are able to sustain it and over a period of time, the number of injection tends to go down. So this is what we all know. But then we know that pharmacotherapy has limitations. Limitations in terms of clinical limitations that it doesn't affect, uh, no effect on micular hypoxia, you require multiple injection. Not all patients are gaining vision. Some people actually are losing vision also in spite of anti-VEGF. Side effects are low but not zero. I'm just enumerating the side effects. And then there is the financial burden. For the patient, imagine a 65 year old diabetic who is taking injections every year for almost 20 injections in three years. He's spending out of 12 lakh out of his pocket with add to it, OCT, FFA, visit cost. So it's it's a burden. Whether you work with eccentrics or aflibercept or bevacizumab or a biosimilar, there's nowhere a, a kind of a easy option for a patient. Uh, even for a doctor, it is not easy. And we have to understand all these patients which are there financially burdened, unlike AMD, they are younger patients, they are mostly working class patients. And they're taking other treatments for diabetes in terms of hypertension treatment, kidney treatment. So their costs are quite a bit. Even for a doctor, the burden is a lot. You have to understand that patient, uh, the moment you go from third injection to the fourth injection, the patient starts to look for alternatives. He's asking you a question, how many more injections or do I need more? How much more do I need to spend? There is option of laser, there is option of steroid. We, even if we don't want to, looking at the financial burden of the patient as conscious doctors, we start increasing the follow-up duration of our patient. We may start using treatment options, which we ourselves know is not literature proven as to be as effective as otherwise. So we start looking for alternatives. So with all this understanding, what I have understood is it's best to customize your therapy from start. Look at what is now we call as the biomarkers based management of DME which is what I start doing it from very early in treatment. I start looking at clues within the imaging which can help me to pick up what kind of a regime this patient may go for, what kind of a molecule may work best for him. 
So when we talk about biomarker, the concept of biomarker in DME is not new. The biomarkers that we conventionally are been using are visual acuity, central macular thickness, cystoid macular edema versus neurosensory detachment, hard exudates on fundus photo, uh, looking at foveal avascular zone on FFA. These are the markers or the VR interface changes. These are the markers which we have look, been looking at since a long time. There's nothing new in these biomarkers, but there were limitations in these biomarkers, especially if you look at visual acuity. A lot of studies have found that there is not even enough correlation between visual acuity and central macular thickness. Uh, not always a retina which looks very edematous will have poor vision or a retina which looks very dry will have good vision. So they have found there is not significant correlation between visual acuity and CMT. So that called in for a need for newer biomarkers which I am going to just briefly touch upon which I use now to kind of guide my treatment in uh, DME management. I predominantly divide these biomarkers for myself into three kind of biomarkers which try to answer three questions. One, will the vision improve or what are the prognostic biomarkers? Whether I need a surgical management or a medical management? And then the basic question, anti vegf versus steroid. Basically, we're trying to find out whether this patient is on an inflammatory pathway more or a VEGF pathway more. Question two, easy to answer. We look at the VR interface on OCT. If I see an obvious traction on the macula, a thick hyaloid or thick membrane, I know this patient is more likely to benefit from a surgical approach rather than a medical management. Question one, will the vision improve? So there are certain biomarkers which are considered good biomarkers and others which are considered at poor prognostic biomarkers. Subretinal fluid is generally considered a out a better response to treatment and a good visual acuity though they may have initial visual acuity poor their response to treatment is pretty good presence of large intraretinal cystoid spaces especially large subfoveal cyst spanning through multiple layers of retina is a poor prognostic marker in terms of visual acuity presence of intracystic hyperrefractive material which you can see here in in the top cyst that hyperrefractive material within the cyst is considered a sign of poor prognostic marker we very closely look at photoreceptor integrity in terms of ISOS junction and EZ integrity and a break in ISOS and EZ is a sign of poor prognostic marker. This comes with a small caveat that in presence of cystoid edema which is quite large you may not always be able to pick it up but if it is present then you can be surely be sure that this patient is going to have a good visual recovery if the EZ and ISOS is intact. Last is uh, disorganization of retinal inner layers, which is basically where the inner retinal layers lose out on their differentiation, where now in this zone, you cannot really differentiate which is the nerve fiber layer, which is the out inner plexiform layer. You lose that differentiation. And once that happens, that's a sign of poor prognostic marker. So studies have shown that with treatment, some amount of drill reversal can also happen. Coming to the third question, which biomarkers can help me pick between anti-VEGF and steroids? So there are three markers which are considered uh, markers of inflammation. The first is hyperreflective foci. Presence of large number of hyperreflective foci within either the nerve, retinal nerve fiber layer or in the choroidal layer is a sign of inflammation where you can tend to bend more towards use of steroids, especially in cases which are non-responding to anti-VEGF. Presence, the deeper these high reflective foci, the more number of high reflective foci, more central the high reflective foci, they are associated with worse prognosis and need for steroid lot more. Number two, we so just showing an example. Uh, this is a 56 year old female diagnosed diabetic for eight years, has DME. And if you look at this slide, patient has high reflective foci, there is subretinal fluid, there is extensive hard oxuate, the EZ. Uh, plus minus patient was advised steroid implant but lost to follow up when she came back the picture had changed the high reflective foci number had gone up the subretinal fluid had gone but the intraretinal fluid has gone up now you know at this stage the visual prognosis tends to become not as good as it was when the patient had initially presented and that's what happened you gave steroid the patient responded but the visual acuity did not improve that much compared to another the other eye of the patient patient who presented with a vision of 2080 also had high reflective foci and SRF with few subfoveal cystoid changes that EZ was looking better in this eye. The patient again lost to follow up but did not worsen that much in this. If you look, there is still an intact 
EZ which you can make out. The drill is not there and high, few high reflective foci is there. Patient got steroid, responded, achieved a vision of 20-30. And quickly going on, we do not forget the role of laser. Laser still has a role in cases of non-center involving edema, if especially visual acuity is good or uh, edema is thentic in the fovea but not involving it and the leaking points are away from the fovea, focal laser still has a role. Uh, I'll just skip through this. And last but not the least, I would, okay, so laser treatment in DME is still a valid option in specific situations such as focal areas of edema with leaking microaneurysms safely away from fovea as a second line or rescue treatment when you want to stabilize your anti-VEGF and reduce the number of injections. And patients with PDR and CSME, you can definitely consider laser. And we cannot forget most important in diabetic patients, there is a lot of role of systemic control. As your therapy is going on, you talk a lot to your patient about getting their parameters under your control because the better the parameter control is there, the systemic parameter control better is going to be your response to any kind of treatment. So that's a very important thing in diabetic macular edema. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Ritesh. Uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, uh, because diabetic macular edema, one of the diseases which is encountered in day-to-day -day practice. Any questions? Uh, uh, Ritesh, uh, one thing I'd like to add, uh, uh, I'll ask you, how frequent, if it is a central involving macular edema also, uh, you give anti-VEGF and when do you go in, for, if it's not resolving, when do you go in for laser? So, generally, I do not uh, consider laser, keeping the patient's uh, cost and follow-up issues not in mind. If that is not a consideration, and that is always a consideration. Uh, once because we see a lot of patients practice. which come to me uh, from day one are coming from far off. So in those cases where I know the issue of follow-ups is going to come, and patient is not very keen for regular follow-up, I'll after three injections I would tend to do an FFA and try to look for leaking points outside the foveal, safely away from FAZ. But conventionally, if the patient has no follow-up issues, I generally like to go beyond three injections would like to stretch it to four, six, two, six injections and see the response to a treatment before I add laser. So I would love to take them to six injections before I add laser, but keeping follow-up considerations and patients for, uh, issue with cost, after three, at least I try to push them to three injections and then do a laser and look for leaks. Yeah, quick question. Yeah. Uh, um, sir, uh, Dr. Sujat Karangar from Srinagar. Sir, I have a question. Uh, since we have to give a lot of anti of injections in uh, diabetic macular edema, uh, how far it is safe for a uh, kidney function? Because we have reported some patients, uh, their creatinine level gets slightly up. Yeah. What's your say, sir, on that? So this is a couple of papers which had come in and that has caused a lot of discussion happening in amongst physicians about it, where they are blaming uh, renal loss or renal dysfunction to anti-VEGF. We still don't have a level one evidence to prove that. Yes, a lot of physicians do come back and say that to our patients, unfortunately, that because of anti-VEGF, your renal function has gone down. Uh, personally, I don't feel that it the amount we are injecting in the eye to have that strong a systemic impact. Uh, I don't have any proven level one evidence to support their claims as of now. Uh, I think they need to work hard on a on their, uh, the physicians need to work hard on that. That's my take on it. But leave thank you, sir. The uh, with this, uh, we'll request uh, Professor Nitin Varma uh, to uh, give his uh, keynote address in this session. Uh, Dr. Nitin Varma is uh, President Transco and is guest of honor in our uh, inaugural uh, in this present uh, All India Ophthalmic Society meeting a very good clinician and a uh, surgeon. Sir, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to be part of uh, the AIOC. It's always great for me to come meet friends, but above all, learn a lot. I'm going to talk to you about geographic atrophy. Geographic atrophy is a, is a very... Uh, sort of common, uh, not often discussed, but uh, fortunately something is coming around the corner. I'd like to acknowledge the input of Robin Geimer, Mary Raphael, and Ursula Schmidt for, uh, I've used some of their materials. 
Currently, there are no treatment approved for GA, either to prevent it, to slow its development, or once it's established, to slow its progression. But uh, there's uh, novel interventions in the pipeline, and I think once the first drug is approved, it will change not only the life of the patient, but also the life of the ophthalmologist. Uh, and I think what I'm trying to tell you or trying to share with you today is what's around the corner and how we should be prepared for it. Uh, it's not going to be like the treatment of neovascular AMD where you treat everybody. And so uh, we really need to start thinking about geographic atrophy. Geographic atrophy has traditionally been defined based on the appearance of a color fundus photograph. There's nothing more that's needed to define and detect geographic atrophy. But inherited retinal disease can often mimic geographic atrophy. And obviously, you need to differentiate between the two. Otherwise, uh, you know, you can treat one or you can help one, but you can't help the other. So the, the, the thing to look at is the presence of drusen because you won't get drusen in IRD. You'll get drusen in... in uh, macular degeneration. Another uh, commonly should be used, but not commonly uh, used, is uh, fundus autofluorescence, because this gives us the ability to, to delineate geographic atrophy. It also gives us the ability to detect the growth of the geographic atrophy over time. And it's also a very good way to show a patient, like, this, is, this is what it is, and whatever is black, on the fluorescence, on the uh, autofluorescence, are the areas that are not working, and they're the areas that don't see. But all the trials for geographic atrophy really looking at fundus autofluorescence as, you know, uh, as as the sign of growth. When you do autofluorescence, there are common uh, patterns of geographic atrophy, uh, but. On the autofluorescence, you can see there are either focal changes, there are banded changes, or diffuse trickling changes. It's the diffuse trickling changes which are on the side which uh, tell you that the geographic atrophy is going to progress faster than the other two. So we really need to start thinking about autofluorescence. Now, geographic atrophy is a multifactorial complex pathogenesis of which perhaps 70% is genetic and 30% is to do with lifestyle and, and uh, physiology. And of course, there's no lecture or no treatment that is complete without looking at the genetics. And we know that the number of genes have got a role to play in the complement system. And there's plenty of evidence for that. In the development of geographic atrophy, there are a number of pathways implicated. And the treatments that we've got for geographic atrophy are designed to address many parts of this pathway. So this is what's in the therapeutic pipeline for geographic atrophy. Uh, but I'm going to concentrate on uh, the complement pathway today because that's what's really around the corner. We can detect C3 and C5. These are complement proteins in Drusen and also in the sub-RP space in AMD using immunofluorescence. So uh, it makes sense to suppress this pathway and maybe reduce the growth of the geographic atrophy. So one such uh, drug is Pegacetacoplan, which is a complement inhibitor that targets the C3 and C3B. Uh, whether it comes from the classical pathway, the lectin pathway, or the alternative pathway, if you block C3, we could, we could protect the cell and prevent cell death. The, the, the study that's just, uh, that has been published but is going to guide our next step in the treatment of GA are the Oaks and Derby trials. They're pretty similar. One used microperimetry and one didn't. But really, it was the injection of Pegacetoplan either monthly or bimonthly, or then, of course, the sham arm. And it, it really looked at the progression of uh, the growth or the slowing of the growth as the primary endpoint at 12 months and then also a couple of other parameters at 24 months. So it's a big study with over 1,200 participants worldwide. And I'll just go through very simply the reduction in the rate of growth, as you can see. Uh, in the first 12 months was only 16% uh, in the Oak study, and in the Derby study was even less. So it sort of was, mm, is it really working or not? But when you go on to 24 months, you can see the arms are 
diverging from each other, indicating also that the uh, every every month versus every other month, every month was better. But together, they had similar results and was much better than sham. This is an example of uh, growth of the lesion. Let's, you know, uh, geographic atrophy, linear growth is about 100 to 150 microns per year. So really, you're looking at small amounts of retinal tissue that are being lost. You can convert the, the measurements into the amount of preservation of of retinal tissue, as you can see here, uh, you know, 0.82 square millimeters of retinal tissue uh, in this graph. But as you go on towards 24 months, you can see that the amount of retinal tissue, whether it's subfoveal or non-subfoveal lesions, uh, you know, that there, there is preservation. And in geographic atrophy, most of the preserved tissue or the remaining tissue is non-subfoveal. So. Um, so it sort of changes the paradigm a bit because things like BCBA and all don't really matter. What matters is the reduction in growth of the, uh, of the lesion and whether it's subfoveal or non-subfoveal, the uh, effect is there. You can also calculate the number of cells, the photoreceptor cells that are uh, saved and that's shown over here. BCBA, as I said, is not, a, is not a good indicator simply because there's no good vision to start with. So it's nice to look at uh, lesions at about 250 microns from the foveal center. And that is where this, this sort of diagram comes in because the BCVA is correlated with the proportion of the fovea occupied by the geographic atrophy. And you can see here that uh, the BCVA, the less the foveal involvement, uh, you know, the BCVA is better. But if you look at lesions that are 250 microns away, you can see that the baseline BCV is actually preserved, as you can see here. Micropyrametry in the junctional zone, which is 250 micron and, uh, and beyond, can actually prove this point. And what we've seen is that if you do micropyrametry there, you can show that there is a functional preservation in terms of reduction in mean sensitivity and also the number of scotomatous points so there is retinal tissue preservation and functional improvement. This uh, animation from Vienna, from Ursula, you can see that photoreceptor alteration exceeds and precedes RPE loss. So there's, there's photoreceptor thinning, which is found in the junctional zone, but this photoreceptor loss happens before uh, uh, RPE loss. So, uh, using AI uh, and OCTs, you can see in these graphs that they look quite similar to what the Oaks and Derby study graph showed. So we can see that the loss of photoreceptors and therefore RPE, as that gets more function also decreases. So it's one tool that one can use to see what's going on. The adverse events were similar in both studies no events of intraocular inflammation or endophthalmitis. But what was interesting was the development of neovascular AMD in eyes uh, who were getting monthly injections was much higher than the other arms. But these were mainly occult lesions, obviously not subfoveal because there was nothing in the foveal region and they were treated with anti-VEGF. So that's one thing to consider. And also to remember that these injections are, are you know, much higher volume than the standard anti-VEGF, they are 0.1 mil. And so there was no problem with intraocular pressures. So other trials working on the complement pathway, this one which supplement, which reduces the C5, uh, you know, with Zimura also has similar results. This is the GATHER trial. So it looks like the pathway uh, inhibiting, uh, you know, complement activation seems to be one way to go. And so new results will again uh, what about people with bilateral uh, GA and, and uh, the inhibition of complement factor B can be done with a subcutaneous injection because a complement factor B comes from the liver. So that might be something that we are all looking for the holy grail to be treating eye disease without poking the eye. Uh, gene therapy in Australia, we've got three trials going on, the Explore, the Horizon and the Telescope trial. The advantage here, it's a one-shot one treatment but I think we just need to watch this space. And finally, 
the reduction of cell death uh, is still in the phase one situation. So there's a lot happening in the geographic atrophy space. I think from our side, we need to be prepared for it. We need to start thinking of geographic atrophy as a disease that something should, will be, can be done for in terms of reducing uh, progression. Again, you want to be able to demonstrate progression by using, using autofluorescence for now. You need to be able to start the dialogue with your patients and saying, listen, something's coming. We're going to map it and see whether your GA is static or it's moving, in which case you can offer them treatment. But above all, we need to be able to confidently diagnose GA, and it's very, it's not so difficult, so that when the new drugs come, we are ready to help our patients with them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nitin. That was uh, an excellent talk. Uh, can I, is there any question for Dr. Nitin? Uh, Dr. Nitin, just one uh, question. This is being a Cyphovray has been uh, approved as a m monthly injection in cases of geographic atrophy, FD approved. Uh, what kind of patients in your clinical practice do you think a geographic atrophy? What kind of patients would be the first movers to try and use this as a monthly injection to prevent? Uh, are you targeting looking at more of those with preserved foveal function as of now who would be looking at using it more often? So ge geographic atrophy traditionally starts in the, not in the foveal region, but in yeah. the perifoveal region. Yeah. So that you can have many patients who've got geographic atrophy with good visual, uh, you know, with BCVA. So obviously these would be the patients that you would like to pick up early enough to offer them treatment. But the main thing is two things. One, to, uh, to have a confident diagnosis of GA, which I think if you can see the choroidal vessel, there are a few drusen, and you sort of say, yeah, that must be it. And the other thing is to demonstrate progression. So early autofluorescence, uh, you know, to detect movement, because all this takes place over months and years. Right. I think that's really the key, to be able to identify these patients, have a dialogue, because unlike neovascular AMD, where there could be not only preservation of function, but also improvement, in this game, uh, it's really at this stage about slowing deterioration. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, the next uh, talk will be on uh, treatment regimens uh, in new vascular AMD. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ravindra Gupta, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lalit, for having me here. 90% uh, of our AMD patients, if we look at, is what is dry AMD, and rest 10% of the patients are neovascular age-related macular degeneration. Uh, treatment of neovascular age-related macular degeneration can be classified according to the site of lesion. Uh, that is, if you have an extra foveal lesion, then you can treat this lesion with thermal laser and you give a permanent treatment. Type of AMD lesions will decide about ve what VEGF to use. Like in a normal AMD patient, you need to inject with ranizumab or bevacizumab. But if you have a patient of PCB or a pachychoroid disease, will require a fibrocept or brolizumab. If you look into the genesis of age-related macular degeneration before 1980, we didn't have treatment. Thermal laser came in 1980s. And in 2000, we shifted in terms of stabilization of vision and we came up with photodynamic therapy. And the major breakthrough was in 2006 when we started about improvement in vision and not stabilization of vision in subfoveal age-related macular degeneration and when anti-VEGF therapy came. And now we are talking about increased durability, reduced treatment burdens and improved anatomical outcomes. Uh, if you look at the different approaches, uh, we started with the monthly regime and then we, ship, uh, we have observe and plan, wait and extend, treat and extend, and PR, and, and we'll discuss each of the regime, how we go ahead with this. Uh, it's important uh, before going for a, a treatment, you should always recognize extra foveal lesion. 
Now, this is one of the patient who came with a decreased vision and you can see this yellowish kind of a lesion uh, just above the macula. And if you do a fluorescein angiography, you can see there is a cartwheel appearance and there is a leak from early to late phase that shows that this is an uh, uh, CNV but important thing here is you can see this CNV is away from the fovea so 20% of the CNV are away uh, from the fovea and you can do thermal laser please do not miss this CNV because you can give finite treatment to these patients if we look at the OCT pictures you will see a, a SRF subfoveal uh, fluid here and then CNVM uh, in this area. There is a large uh, octa picture shows there is a large CNVM and it's interesting that the octa shows a larger lesion as compared, compared to the fluorescein angiography. So what we did in this patient, we gave one injection of uh, uh, ranizumab and treated this extra foveal lesion with the thermal laser. You can see day 30 picture, the fluid has almost disappeared. And day 60, you can see the laser has taken up. There is a scar here. There is no fluid on B scan overlay. And patient had a definite end to the treatment. Otherwise, you would, if you don't recognize this patient, you will keep on injecting throughout the life. Uh, these are uh, pre-op, uh, 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 pre-treatment OCT and post-treatment OCT. Coming to the subfoveal CNVM, where the major line of treatment is uh, anti-VEGF, uh, the regime what we usually follow is uh, uh, PRN regime, and that is you give three injections, and whenever the vision decreases, you go ahead and uh, uh, inject again. Uh, the most uh, now from PRN regime, the main problem with PRN regime was we were losing vision in this patient, so we shifted to treat and extend uh, in age related macular degeneration. The basic concept of treat and extend is even if you don't have any SRF, then also you have to inject. That's very important. SRF is or intraretinal fluid is not mandatory in treat and re extend regime. So, uh, you start with every four weekly, then if the fluid has dried up, you shift to six weeks, injection at six weeks, then uh, you extend by another eight weeks and you can extend till 12 weeks. Anytime, like if you are extending by two weeks and you find the SRF or the intraretinal fluid comes, like if the intraretinal fluid comes at 10 weeks, then you reduce the duration to eight weeks. So now you keep on injecting at eight weeks. Uh, this is one of the examples. You can see this is a, a subfoveal CNVM. There is a fluid here. You can see a yellowish white lesion here. And if we see the, uh, we injected this patient and we followed this observe and extend. Uh, in injection one, you can see the fluid has gone. The injection uh, third, the fluid has disappeared. These are octa pictures and you can see here, there is a CNVM after one injection, the size of the CNVM has reduced. After the second injection, you can see again, this a CNVM has disappeared and only you have the mature vessels. Uh, this is another patient. Uh, we started this patient uh, on uh, and treat and observe, but now what happens, we started this patient with AFLIB recept and uh, uh, usually we were giving this patient injection at six uh, week interval, but this patient became resistant to AFLIB recept or ILEA. And then after three weeks only, the patient used to uh, get fluid or SRF with blurring of vision. We shifted this patient to brolizumab and with brolizumab, we were able to extend, treat and extend to five weeks. The moment patient comes to six weeks, he says, I have a blurring in vision and he says, Ki you inject me because he is only one night patient. And in this patient, I have given 26 injections of brolizumab with no inflammatory reaction. Uh, if we see what is treat and extend, if you uh, 
first start the treatment then you go for an observe and extend where uh, there is a reduced number of injections as compared to treat and extend uh, if you look at the uh, these uh, the, on the left side what you can see are the bars of uh, prn regime and on the right side these are the bars for uh, treat and extend the number of injections required in both the uh, uh, disease protocol were almost the same and the vision improvement was almost the same in number of visits uh, were good and if you see the vision improvement was more in treat and extend in uh, two 10 letters this is one of the patient a 39 years old male with came with defective vision and we did an fluorescein angiography you can see a leak here suggestive uh, it was a csr i observed this patient patient didn't improve and uh, did an edi for this patient and you can see a very thick choroid so diagnose this patient as pachychoroid disease and what Ritesh was uh, talking, uh, in which patient do you inject in cases of CSR? If you can label this patient as chronic CSR, after three months, you can give a, a stronger anti that is dolizumab or uh, aflibercept. Uh, Harbor study uh, was one of the studies with, which was a 24-month efficacy and safety of 0.5 milligram and 2 milligram of uh, ranzvap. Conclusions were that 0.5 and 2 milligram of ranuzumab in CNBM number of injections and letter gain was same, meaning thereby there is no advantage of 2 milligram. Uh, in Lucas study, comparison of uh, ranuzumab and bevacizumab for neovascular age-related uh, uh, macular degeneration according to Lucas and treat and extend protocol. Uh, if you uh, look here, the number of injections required were 16 in ranuzumab group and 18.2 in bevacizumab group, and the later gain was almost same uh, in uh, both the uh, treatment protocols. Uh, a TREX study was a prospective trial of treat and extend versus monthly dosing of neovascular age-related um, macular degeneration, and they showed and there was a uh, a better gain in uh, treat and extend uh, that is 10.5 letters and there was a better drying of the disease uh, if we look at what is the pattern practiced world over if you look in united states uh, treat and extend is the most preferred technique uh, in Europe, uh, treat and extend and uh, PRN regime. Uh, PRN regime is more pre prevalent. Uh, in India, treat and extend and PRN is equally follows, uh, followed. So to summarize, extrafoveal lesion should not be missed as early diagnosis and treatment can give fi uh, uh, finite results. Choice of anti-VEGF depends on type and subtype of lesions and financial status. Classic, occult or minimally classic lesions and wrap lesions, any anti vegf will do. PCV and pachychoroid spectrum, brolismap and aflibrofacet is the treatment of choice. Treat and extend regime gives the best results with optimization of the visit. Thank you very much. So very good uh, talk, uh, Dr. Abhinder. Uh, what are the let's go brief and with what should a practitioner start with so if you see a patient what are the basic investigations uh, which are required to start treatment and then what is the drug you would start with so uh, if i have a patient of uh, amd uh, the basic treatment i'll do is an oct and at first sitting i'll also do a fluorescein angiography because my follow-up will depend on subsequent OCTs and I will not do uh, subsequent uh, fluorescein angiography. And uh, <coughs> if I have classified lesions as uh, classical or uh, type 2 or type 3 CNVM, then I will go for any anti-VEGF. And But if I diagnose it as in PCV or a type 1 lesion, then I will go for an brolizumab or aflibrocept. Yeah, so it's a very good point. One is OCT is enough to start treatment. OCT angio, if you have, is good, but OCT angio is not mandatory. 
the cnvm seen on angio is not really what dictates your treatment in the future because you may continue to see the same cnvm over multiple follow ups but and it may remain quiet without treatment so as of now oct angio is not enough to uh, is not important enough to guide treatment it's okay to have information and uh, important is you can start with ranibizumab but unless you have pcv with pro, uh, with peds pigment epithelial detachments which requires aflibercept or drolizumab where ranibizumab doesn't work well especially if there's also massive hemorrhage do we have time for more discussion or uh, no i just wanted to add one small point uh, a very basic thing which i started regularly doing now is fundus photograph for all these patients very important to pick up uh, any fresh hemorrhages more than fluorescein angiography or oct angiography a good clinical examination fundus yes. photo yes. it adds lot more to our treatment decision rather than exactly a hemorrhage or a obvious elevation is yes is much more important than anything so clinical exam is of course irreplaceable yeah. Uh, sir, uh, what is your most commonly used regimen of all that you have discussed now? Treat and expand versus PRN. See, I start with observe and extend. And like if I have a, a treatment naive patient, three injections. If the lesion dries, then I uh, go shift on to observe. And once the lesion bounces back, then I uh, uh, go in for a PRN kind of a regime. but many patients uh, i know ki after a period of time i know when the recurrence is uh, occurring so many patients will come and tell me ki after uh, 12 weeks they'll say ki or after 10 weeks they'll see my vision has worsened so un, in those patients i follow treat and extend so it's not that ki all patients go on treat and extend uh usually the chronic one which requires continuous inhibition of with anti vegf go to treat and extend but 50% of my patients are on prn regime and uh, any experience of combining steroid for patients with pcv like some people say that you can combine steroids with anti vegf in these patients uh we were combining uh, steroids when uh, when we were doing photodynamic therapy but at the moment we are not doing See, as any a routine, combination as a routine it is not recommended but uh, there is, there are an, there is an occasional case which will not respond to multiple aflibercept injections and if you add a steroid it will settle down immediately so there can be an occasional case and so we can use it as an additional armamentarium thank you go ahead uh next i call upon uh, dr malika goel ma'am to uh, take us through the treatment options for macular edema following vein occlusions and uh, i would just like to ask one brief last question dr agninder if you have a massive submacular bleed just briefly how would you uh, uh, approach first thing i'll look at the vision if the vision is good then i'll go for anti vegf treatment if the vision is low and the bleed is submacular then my first choice will be give uh, a c3 f8 depending i can combine with uh, tpa with c3 f8 with anti vegf so after giving c3 f8 and tpa usually the uh, blood uh, the idea is to displace the blood from the sub sub foveal area and once this blood displaces there is a vision improvement but the final treatment will be anti vegf if the patient comes early enough say within 2 days you may not need tpa even just anti vegf and gas would be enough if it's more than 2 3 days you feel the blood would have clotted then you can add a tpa okay so i'll speak on retinal vein occlusions uh, mainly my experience so the first important thing of course is to look for comorbidities and uh, identify and treat which are the most common listed here the ocular morbidity very common is glaucoma so look carefully for it we can miss it and the importance of identifying coexisting glaucoma is the treatment also changes if it's a glaucomatous eye you will avoid steroids for macular edema and uh, for glaucoma management in these patients you will try to avoid the drops which cause macular edema such as prostaglandin analogs or alpha agonists you will probably switch to uh, beta blockers 
Now, classification of retinal vein occlusions depends on the site of occlusion, uh, whether it's a central retinal vein, hemiretinal, or BRVO. And central and hemiretinal vein occlusions could be ischemic or non-ischemic. And the treatment also, the treatment and more importantly, the prognosis depends on whether it is ischemic or non-ischemic. And in branch vein occlusions, it could be a major or a macular vein. When you are dealing with an ischemic uh, CRVO or HRVO, the macular edema will be very severe. The visual uh, vision is very poor at presentation, usually hand movements or counting fingers at 2 meters. And the prognosis is poor. We can tell the patient that even with injection, the edema will go, but vision will not improve because of ischemia. And they are the ones who are likely to come back with repeated edema and recurrent injections required over several years. On the, so this is a patient an example. Sometimes, on the other hand, you may not have much edema, but the vision is disproportionately poor in these ischemic cases. And despite injections, they may go into macular ischemia. No edema, but very poor vision because of ischemia. So prognosis remains poor. And in these patients, while we are treating the edema, we need to be vigilant for new vessels on the iris and new vascular glaucoma. On the other hand, in non-ischemic uh, CRVO, the edema is mild. Vision is 6, 9, 6, 18 at presentation and improves rapidly and they may require very few injections, may not come back with many recurrences. Treatment of HRVO macular edema is really not well defined. You could treat it as CRVO where you don't do laser or you could treat it as BRVO where you can add laser after anti vegfs because there are no studies to guide us on HRVO macular edema. Macular branch vein occlusions they are a little straightforward in that we don't expect neovascularization because the area of involvement is very small. So we don't expect proliferative retinopathy. So as I mentioned in RVO, what is very different from DME, diabetic macular edema, is constantly to look for the new vessels on the iris at every visit in every patient of HRVO and CRVO. Not to miss that, especially when the macular edema is gone and we have stopped giving anti vegf frequently. That is when the new vessels on the iris will start coming in. And we have to pick it up for early laser. And in BRVO, we have to keep looking for new vessels in the periphery or on the new vessels on the disc because again, these demands laser at the same time. So not to miss these serious problems while we are treating the macular edema. Investigations, photography is very important. It captures things which OCT cannot capture such as hard exudates, which will not be captured accurately by OCT. Hard exudates are extremely important. They can cause permanent damage. So we have to prevent these coming into the fovea rather than rush after them when they've already involved the fovea because they will leave behind some damage permanently. So this is to show a patient who has come with inferotemporal BRVO, which is not visible now because she has been getting anti vegfs But if you do an angiogram, you can see it's an inferotemporal BRVO causing exudates. So we gave her an injection and you see within uh, five to six weeks, the exudates have started uh, resolving. And now we did laser for the patient. This is another patient, we gave an injection, but despite that at four weeks, the exudates are remaining the same. Of course, it, exudates take more time. They take a few months to resolve. But we have to prevent involvement. Now this patient is six by six. There's no edema, but why we are treating him is to prevent this fovea, this exudate from entering right into the foveal center, which is when he will lose vision and not recover easily. This is another patient we did not treat. So you can see within a few days, within the same month, his hard exudate has moved into the foveal center. You can see the left and the right pictures. So this is how important it is to treat foveal exudates in a preventive manner. Here it is to show that Edema and exudates behave in different manner. We inject it and at four months later, the edema is little less, but exudates are increasing because the gap is too much. When you see exudates, the treatment has to be a little more aggressive every two months rather than four to six months because that allows the exudates to increase despite treatment. Now, photograph can capture the loss of hard exudates over time, over four years, which OCT is not capturing as you see. So you can show the patient that because of treatment, your exudates have gone though edema is still persisting and vision has not changed. Fluorescein angiogram is very important to show how to treat the edema with laser because it captures the leakage which OCT angiogram cannot show where is the leakage. Now these are the multiple studies related to management of retinal vein occlusion which uh, you know which everybody can see. So 
the first line of treatment in retinal vein occlusions remains anti-VEGFs, not steroids, because steroids have too many complications. And these are the more recent studies which have shown that aflibercept of the available anti-VEGFs has a much better uh, visual and anatomic result compared to bevacizumab and compared even to ranibizumab. Significantly fewer injections are required with a greater proportion of patients uh, which, have, which have a thinner macula, better vision. And those though, that are not responding to ranibizumab or require injections every four to five weeks, if they are switched to aflibercept, the treatment free interval shifts to nine weeks from five weeks. So it doubles. So it reduces the treatment burden in, with additional improvement in vision and uh, reduction in central retinal thickness. So then what, what are the indications for steroids? Is, does it have any role? It is indicated when steroids are contra, uh, when anti-VEGFs are contraindicated. That is very simple. Anti-VEGFs are contraindicated when there is a recent history of cerebrovascular or coronary events, pregnancy or severe nephropathy. Also when we are finding some tractional retinal detachments already present and the patient uh, has active new vessels, there if we give anti-VEGF, the TRD can worsen. So there you might want to use steroid for the edema component and do laser for the proliferative component. And of course it is used when there is a suboptimal response to anti-VEGF injections, then steroid can be tried. Or when we are planning cataract surgery, it can be chosen over anti-VEGF because it can cover the anti-inflammatory, uh, the inflammatory aspect as well. Steroids to be definitely avoided in patients with glaucoma, those who have prior history of ocular infections like CMV or a large PC opening which can allow anterior migration of the DEX implant with corneal loss. Laser has a role only for macular, uh, uh, for uh, branch vein occlusions where you have to do an angio, fluorescent angiogram to know where is the leakage and then target that area with uh, laser. Laser is, nowadays laser is done only after the macula has been first dried out with anti-VEGFs because then the laser energy required is less and it is more effective. So first anti-VEGF and then macular laser for BRVO. But we still do it only if we are sure that the edema is going to recur repeatedly if the patient is coming back. If the patient does not need more than one or two anti-VEGFs, then there is no benefit to adding laser because laser also has risks. There is a long-term risk of foveal involvement with the scar enlargement, CNVM coming up later on, scotomas and other problems. So laser is also risky, should be added if the patient is repeatedly coming back with uh, macular edema following BRVO. In CRVO, there is no value for uh, laser. And if the vision is disproportionately poor compared to the edema, it could be because there is a retinal artery occlusion, which is commonly associated with CRVO, as in this patient. You can see an area of infarct, the white area in the macula. And lastly, uh, uh, RVO in the young, it happens. Uh, look for any drugs, oral contraceptives, sildenafil. And uh, the prognosis is usually good. Just one anti-VEGF injection may be, uh, is usually enough. They don't come back with recurrences. But you have to investigate for collagen vascular diseases and uh, rule out. It should be a diagnosis of exclusion that there is no problem. We had patients with post-COVID infection CRVO and they usually respond to just steroids and anticoagulants. Uh, occasionally, an anti-VEGF may be required. Post-vaccine, these are two young people, one coming with CRVO and BRAO in the same patient and one coming with HRVO. The second patient required an anti-VEGF. The first uh, only steroid and uh, anticoagulants were enough. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am, for that uh, excellent talk. I have a few questions for you. As far as uh, some patients of CRVO sometimes present very early on in their course. Uh, they complain of visual disturbance. I've had a few patients who came with a six by six vision, but they also had a macular edema. So in those patients, would you initiate a treatment? <clears throat> See, the fact that they have come to you is because they are symptomatic. So they are already symptomatic, even if they are six by six. And if they have macular edema, you have to treat it because I have seen that uh, if they don't take the injection for whatever reason, then anyway it worsens. They come back after two weeks with a much worse edema. So uh, for RVO, the standard protocol is to treat. 
Yeah, because most of our study inclusion criteria is six by nine or less vision. So I think they we, would not see have, the uh, fact sorry. patient has come to you is that he is already symptomatic. Yeah. So then we don't so, look so at the vision. The take home message is that if they yes. have a, even a six by six vision and if they yes. have macular edema or edema, yes. so better to treat those patients. Uh, and if, uh, any experience of using uh, PageNax as an initial treatment in these uh, uh, patients as of now, ma'am? No, the risk is the risk is not worth it because there is, there is some risk with uh, brolizumab of inflammation. So why would I take that as first line? I might take it if there is a lesion which is not responding at all to aflibercept also. But otherwise, as a first line in any situation, why would you take the risk? Any other take? If you have a young uh, patient with uh, uh, central retinal vein occlusion, so how will it differ from an elderly patient? Will you look at some other points into the, these patients? Is your question young patient versus elderly? Yeah. Yeah, young patient, see, in a young patient, um, we already know the prognosis is going to be good, first of all. So our counseling is different. We investigate for a different set of diseases. Though we do look for diabetes, lipids, and blood pressure, we are actually looking more for leukemia or uh, hyperviscosity syndrome, sarcoidosis, SLE, uh, some of these diseases by doing a CBP and all. Most of the time, these will be negative. And in that case, we label it as idiopathic and we treat it with anti vegf if there is macular edema. Is there any role of steroids in these? Yeah, earlier patients? when we didn't have anti vegf that much, we used to give only oral steroids. But uh, the, the morbidity or side effects, even in young people, is not worth it. And we don't find the same result. So anti vegf gives an immediate result. So I think now there is no point in trying steroids, oral steroids. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, with that, uh, we come to the last talk of this session. Uh, Dr. Avaninda Gupta, sir, will be speaking on uh, aperitoneal membrane management. Uh, thank you, Raju. Uh, I'll be talking about approach to aperitoneal membranes. It was first described by Vanoff in 1865. Two percent of the patient above the age of uh, 50 will have uh, aperitoneal membrane, and as the age increases, it becomes 20 percent. Bilateral involvement occurs in 10 to 20 percent of the patient. And if you look at the Beaver Dam study, which is an OCT based study, suggested higher prevalence of epiretinal membrane that was at the range of 34.5, 34 percent. Uh, uh, in 2016, preferred practice guidelines of epiretinal membrane over a period of five years. Uh, this is very important because 29 percent of the patient progressed. 26% of the patient regressed and 39% remained stable. So the patient who were eligible for treatment was only one third. So any patient who comes to you with decreased vision because an epiretinal membrane, don't directly go in and advise surgery. Please observe for at least two to three months and then go ahead for a treatment in this patient. It's an idiopathic condition, can occur after uh, RD surgery, non-proliferative retinovascular disorders, inflammatory disease, trauma, and after cryopexy and photocoagulation. It usually presents as asymptomatic in majority of cases. 5% of the patient will have vision less than 660. There is a reduced vision and a metamorphopsia. If you look at the signs, uh, you will see a, a mild sheen on the posterior pole. There will be a vascular uh, tortuosity and the straightening of paramacular vessels. In advanced cases, you will have a stria or a heterotropy of macula, intraretinal hemorrhages, cystic changes in the macula, pseudo holes, and PVD in 75% of the patient. The most useful investigation at the moment is ocular coherence tomography, which helps us to diagnose whether it's uh, uh, epiretinal membrane. FA is uh, now usually we don't do uh, FA for epiretinal membranes. Uh, coming to the treatment, asymptomatic epiretinal membrane with good visual equity, no treatment is required. If the patient is six, uh, uh, vision is decreased, patient is symptomatic, that means if the vision is less than 624, metamorphopsia, if there is a thick epiretinal membrane, and if you can document a sequential decrease in vision, then it will require a pass planar vitrectomy with an epiretinal membrane removal. Uh, 
you see this patient here there is a large epiretinal membrane and you can see a loss of foveal contour in this patient we took this patient for surgery and uh, first a total pass plana vitrectomy is done you can see a large epiretinal membrane and i use a 25 gauge mvr to create an edge the process of creating an edge is the most important thing while doing an epiretinal membrane surgery it's something like a cellophane retinopathy or the membrane which is stuck onto the uh, retina so if you can create an edge then you the peeling becomes easier whenever you are doing a peeling always go towards the base and don't pull anterior posterior if you pull anterior and posterior you are liable to create breaks and any doubt you go ahead and stain like in this patient i have done an uh, bvg staining which gives a negative staining and i'm going towards the base of the epiretinal membrane and you have to pull the membrane tangentially don't pull anterior posteriorly and this membrane is uh, removed and you can see that this membrane is removed totally a slight area of membrane is left i lost the membrane so i use a diamond scraper to create an edge and now you can see whole of the membrane comes in total these are the post op results uh, this patient improved from 636 to 618 this is another patient uh, post VR surgery, uh, post silicone oil. Uh, you can see the laser marks here. And since the membrane we couldn't identify, so what we have done after a fluid air exchange, we have put a reti blue dye. And with the edge, help of a 25 gauge MVR, the edge of the membrane is created. And once you have created the edge, then the membrane is peeled. You don't have to, uh, in doubt, you don't pull the membrane because if you, uh, any uh, time you feel the resistance is too high, please don't pull it because you will create an hydrogenic breaks. And you can see whole of the membrane has come out in total. And this patient improved from 660 to 612 vision. Uh, the results uh, improvement in visual equity occurs by two lines in 74% of cases. No improvement occurs in 24% of cases. Better results were seen in idiopathic epiretinal membranes. Now, there is another controversy whether to peel an internal limiting membrane with an epiretinal membrane. Liu et al. performed a meta-analysis of ERM surgery with and without ILM peeling. Patient who underwent ILM peeling had better visual equity at 12 months, but by 18 months, no significant difference in both the groups occurred. Micropyrometry showed better results in non-ILM peeling group as compared to epiretinal membrane. So as a preference, I don't do ILM peeling until unless it's uh, required in cases of epiretinal membrane. Uh, if the visual equity preoperatively is bad, CME uh, is there, then you have a bad visual prognosis. Idiopathic uh, uh, mag uh, epiretinal membranes has a better visual prognosis as compared to a non-idiopathic epiretinal membrane. Uh, if you have a good integrity of ES uh, ellipsoid zone on OCT and you will have a good post-operative visual equity. Uh, if the parallelism uh, more parallel the retinal layers, the bit better the visual equity. So you should identify what Dr. Ritesh was telling. Drill. If you have drill, then uh, the vision, the visual improvement will be less as compared to no drill patient. You can have intraoperative complications like vitreous hemorrhage, peripheral retinal breaks, post-operative complications like nucleus crosses, RD infection, and recurrence in 5% of cases. Uh, one of these patients, uh, I landed with a major complication. You can see here an epiretinal membrane here. Uh, I didn't find an edge, so I thought I should go ahead and stain this under an air. So uh, once I am staining and removing this retinal dye, you can see this mound coming here. And after uh, removing the air, I realized that all of this retina, because of just because of the fluid air exchange, has ripped from the edge of the buckle. 
and there is inferior detachment in this patient and uh, this patient uh, I completed the vitrectomy uh, created an edge of the epiretinal membrane and once the edge was created I peel this membrane and this retina inferior retina is now detached so uh, lucky for me I removed the membrane in toto and it came in toto uh, then PFCL was injected vitrectomy was done laser was done to the periphery and uh, instead of air we had to fill this patient with oil and you can see this whole of this area here this has ripped so, uh, so to, to conclude advancement in instrumentation has made macular surgery the most sought after surgery in retinal surgery uh, and uh, ERM at the moment is uh, the most preferred surgery for the retinal surgeons with good visual results. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent videos, uh, Dr. Gupta. Um, when you have a post uh, ER surgery membrane, and let's say the oil is in the eye, but there is now a membrane forming a few weeks later. And it is affecting the vision also. You can see the deterioration. Uh, how do you handle it? Do you remove the oil, even if you don't otherwise want to remove the oil? Would you remove the membrane with the oil, leaving the oil inside, or would you remove it? Uh, it depends on what kind of situation. If it is, there is a detachment or there is an... Uh, some breaks, secondary breaks, then you intervene immediately. Uh, if there is an traction and only epiretinal membrane under the oil, I'll prefer to the, remove the oil and do an ERM surgery simultaneously and leave the eye under air only. And uh, I generally remove, uh, prefer to remove whole of the oil, then go in for an epiretinal membrane. I don't prefer to do it under oil. But sometimes you don't want to remove the oil because there is an inferior break which is open, it is on the buckle, it is lasered, but you are not sure that without the support of oil, there will not be a re-detachment. Then it becomes a, a re-surgery kind of a thing. I'll, uh, so in uh, these cases, I think uh, what I, uh, I would do is, and I do it, is remove the membrane but leave the oil in. And those patients are very happy because the, mem the macula improves. So it can be done. But I think it's better to stabilize the membrane with a periocular steroid in these patients. Uh, it helps to make it a little more uh, you know, consolidated and easier to remove. Yeah, that, that's what, uh, if the membrane is very thin and flimsy membrane, don't, don't go ahead it. and operate. Just wait for two, three yes. months, let the membrane mature and then yes. go in for the yes. surgery. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for this wonderful session. Uh, thank you, sir, for those wonderful videos. We close this session. Thank you.